Hello, everybody, and welcome to Heart to Heart with Sandhya Krishnan. Um, this is where we talk about inspiring stories and getting insights for ourselves. And today we're talking about parenting. And I have a very special guest with me who's also a dear friend. Her name is Nisha Rao, and she's a therapist and an educator. And I'm going to actually ask her to tell you a little bit about the work she does, because I don't, I'm not even sure if a career like hers even existed <laughs> when we were uh, growing up. So first of all, please join me in welcoming Nisha. Hello, Nisha. Welcome to Heart to Heart. I'm so excited that we could finally make this happen. Yes, I'm happy to be here as well, Sandhya. Thank you for having me over. Um, what do I do? So I do a lot of work, but most of it revolves around the child. Uh, but it takes on sort of different forms. So I work one-on-one -on -one, uh, with children. I work with them in groups. Mm -hmm. So I've created learning material. Uh, I call it a life program because these are really essential life skills that children need to go through uh, in terms of um, critical thinking, decision-making, self-awareness, confidence building. How do I communicate? Why do I say what I say? So that's the sort of, you know, in a nutshell, that's what the program is. Mm -hmm. um, but I also work with the child's system. Uh, because that's a very key factor in, in uh, helping the child, you know, <clears throat> that involves being there for parents. So I do parenting workshops. I try to engage with schools, but that's not been easy. Um, that's, that's something that I hope to do more of going ahead. And I volunteer my time working, um, you know, in, in spaces where children from underprivileged backgrounds need some sort of uh, support. So I, I do a lot of diverse work, but mostly revolving around the child. Wonderful, wonderful. This is so, I mean, I was truly inspired, but you know, we've, we've sort of had parallel careers, but, but the, the space that you're in, I really feel is so transformative, the potential for transformation. In a sense, we both are in, in the work of helping people transform themselves, but I feel, yeah. you know, children to have access to have some, to something like this, uh, where somebody really sees them for who they are and, and gives them that opportunity to express themselves is, is invaluable. Um, I do want to know a little bit more about that. Um, but what I wanted to ask you was, you know, in a sense, what you're offering is a nice to have. Um, so often we as parents, we're so fixated on grades and, and, and you know, uh, ROI on our investment into our child, <laughs> return on our investments, which usually translates into good behavior or good grades or, or something that's, um, you know, that we can measure. How success to, usually I've seen success, that. That's yeah. a one. our definition of success, rather, right? Exactly. Yeah. Tell me, tell me, how do parents reach out to you? What makes them reach out to you? And and are there parents that are seeing that these are valuable? In in fact, I would say critical, essential skills for a child to have going forward. So. Um, uh, parents usually reach out, I find, when they find that uh, it's hard to manage, you know, the child's emotion or behavior by themselves. So for you, usually for younger children, and when I, when you, by younger, I mean maybe 11 and lower, uh, parents reach out uh, to me. And a lot of times I find I don't even need to work with the child. What I really need to focus on is uh, psychoeducation, which is, you know, helping the child's environment at home. How are the parents reacting? What sort of structure do they have for the child? You know, how do they speak and engage with the child? What sort of communication happens? What are the disciplining strategies at home? And by discipline, I don't mean punishment, right? Discipline can uh, have a whole different form. So um, with that age group, parents reach out just, you know, sometimes overwhelmed. How do I deal with this situation? Or um, you know, the child is having uh, emotional regulation challenges or behaviorally they're acting out. So a lot of that work is psychoeducation. Uh, with the older age group, um, what I find is I think parents might be able to take care of the child, but really the child is in that rebellious state. And so they're likely to listen to an objective third person rather than the parents, you know, so that helps to just have a sort of outside view and outside opinion, sometimes to just agree with the child or sometimes to, you know, sort of say exactly what the parents would have said, mm. but they're more receptive to it coming from a professional. So true. I see that not just with my kids, but if I do like a workshop in a school, they'd be like, oh yeah, my dad has been saying that for years. And I'm like, 
Yeah, but you know, we don't listen to our own dads. You listen to a third party. Yeah. So, and, and, and as an educator, therapist, my own kid won't listen to me. You know, he's likely to listen to somebody else. So Yeah, yeah. But I think for two reasons. One is that, I mean, earlier this, this role to some extent would have been done by the, the, the large systems of the communities that, that we, we grew up in. Yeah. With so much access to other adults in terms of families, people who came and stayed in our houses, uh, uh, inexplicably for months on end but you know sort of we, we yeah. had that sort of system but equally I think we're in such a complex time and age today that that sometimes a professional can is the only person who can do that job you know however well-meaning an uncle and aunt or a grandparent may be sometimes it does take um, for you to have that that sort of skill in in terms of really hearing a child Absolutely. And it's scientific, you know, so a lot of times when when we're not trained to take care of the child's needs, mm -hmm. we're sort of doing a hit or miss, you know, we're feeling our way through the situation. It might work sometimes, it might not always work. So in terms of a consistency factor, I think it's, it's, it's helpful if, um, you know, the challenges have been uh, sort of consistent or persistent over a period of time, it is better to consult a professional to, to get help for the child. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, also, I'm reminded, Sandhya, you know, you know, when we were in school, yeah. I think teachers came with um, so much experience, you know, most of the teachers then were 40 years, 50 years in the system. So they were, they were not just teachers, but they were very, you know, sort of matronly in the sense of, you know, being able to take care of a lot more uh, than just their subject. And, and more and more I'm finding in the education system, you know, um, teachers sort of you know, quit and move on very quickly, or they're there for such a short time, they're in over their head sometimes because, you know, the, the, the demands from teachers today is so, you know, more focused on academics and administrative stuff rather than being there for the child. So I think we were, also we were more resilient, I think. I think that, you know, that that resilience partly also comes from having less on our plates, like you rightly observed, uh, we're just so the, the number of decisions that that children, adults, teachers have to make. I mean, you see burnout so much in schools. And I'm so happy that there are teachers that are schools that are having like mindfulness training for teachers, because I see the overwhelm. And, and you know, now with lockdown, it's it's the kind of pressure on them also is absolutely, massive, absolutely. Massive. But coming back to the area of your um, uh, focus. Tell me from what you've seen over the years, Nisha, what ails children? What are the, what are the big sort of issues that, that kids come up with? What are their cries and what are their unheard cries that, that we even as parents may not have heard? Mm, I think with the younger age groups, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 even, it's, it's mostly just how to take care of, you know, I, I feel they don't know how, what they're feeling sometimes. So they don't have words or, you know, verbiage to describe that. So uh, just giving them that vocabulary and being able to let them know that they can say it, they don't need to show it, right, mm -hmm. is, is beautiful because the emotions and the behaviors are close, closely uh, connected. When I'm not able to understand what I'm feeling is when I act out because I'm trying to have a need met and I don't know how. So, you know, just giving them, uh, awareness and, and simple ways, you know, I call it a toolkit when I'm working with the smaller ones. What's your toolkit? And some of them already know it. They do it, you know. <laughs> I'll count back from 100 to zero. I'll go drink water. I'll breathe in deeply. So, you know, th these are things that really work for them. For older children, I'm finding, um, you know, those in their teens right up to, and when I say child, I actually work with up to uh, age 24, you know, so and youth as well. Mm. Um, I think it's a sense of self, you know, which is very hard to sort of know or identify because there's just so much out there today. So where do I fit in in, in, in this large world of, of, you know, equally competent people around me, equally resourced people around me? So what's my niche really over here? So with that comes, you know, a sense of self-worth, mm. uh, self-confidence, mm, uh, body image, you know, so so everyone's out there portraying a certain image, you know, so am I good enough? Do I need to, you know, step forward, step back? So these are some of the challenges of the older uh, uh, age group. And mm -hmm. as they're getting into their careers, you know, is this what I want? What's my purpose in life? You know, 
who do I want? Yeah. So I think as they get into you know college, some of the challenges are mostly to do with uh, engaging with peers. You know, how much do I say? How much do I hold back? Uh, how do I communicate what's what's truly you know me, the essence of me? How do I not just portray something? And moving into careers. Um, who do I want to be in my life? You know, what is my purpose? What does success mean to me uh, in today's day and age? So I think these are typically what uh, young people uh, deal with in terms of challenges. Um, you know, even from a, as you rightly said, science-based, right? Because 18 to 24 is when like our cognitive brain, our neocortex really develops. And, and in a way, I feel it's so unfair to ask an 18 year old to, to pick a stream and say, this is going to be a career or this is going to be the rest of your life. Or, or even for, for, for us to get married or get into relationships that, you know, when our brain isn't fully formed, we're not able to see or make decisions that are future thinking enough, that are critical thinking enough. Even the sense of yeah. self is only just developing during this time. So how wonderful that you also work in in that age group of 18 to 24, which we don't even think of as kids, but in a way it's still a developing brain, right? It is, it is. And and they realize it, you know, they they most most young people who I work with, they say it, you know. I still I still sometimes want my parents to just, you know, hold me or love me, you know, not <laughs> not expect me to so responsible all the time. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think same, same here. You know, sometimes you just want to be a child and some of these things are, are never go away and, and as well they shouldn't, right? It's our childlike nature that is most essentially us. And we think that we need to somehow suppress it as adults. But in fact, that's the area that, that we can get uh, our, 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 our brilliance, but also our true potential and also our greatest joy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so in transactional analysis, we say that, you know, the whole uh, innate spontaneity, curiosity and creativity comes from that child space. So true. So true. And, and you know, to be able to celebrate and nurture and give that space and expression is invaluable. Uh, <laughs> um, what is our role then, Nisha, as parents? I mean, again, I know that a lot of the work that you do does involve parents and, mm -hmm. and it's, it's not really, I feel, children that need the training. It's usually the parents, we who need the training. So yeah. if, if I were to try and be a conscious parent, what would be your advice for, for people like us? <clears throat> Mm, see, I truly believe, Sandhya, that as parents, we have the child's best interest at heart. Yeah, we, Our intention is always, always very, very strong, very good. I think it's in the execution that somewhere, you know, we trip ourselves up. And, and why we do that is, you know, because of how we were, we were parented, mm -hmm. the, you know, the sort of cultural landscape that we come from, or the educational, you know, landscape that, that shaped us. So a lot of times... Uh, I, I see parents are, you know, trying to live vicariously through their children. Yeah, they want their children to fulfill their unmet desires or dreams or needs. And that is just not fair to the child, right? And what he or she wants to do or be. And uh, uh, not just that, I think um, sometimes we don't stop to think, you know, why do I do what I do? Why do I say what I say? It's, it's almost as if we're on autopilot. So I think really for us to move into being conscious parents, it's to start to first look deeply inward. Who, who am I? Yeah. Why am I a parent, right? Why do I have this child? Yeah, is it, to, is it to shape them, to program them, or is it to understand them? Is it to see them for who they are? So I think that part of self-reflection, and a lot of times I see that we're trying to fix the child. Like, yeah. you know, it's a broken broken piece of pottery or something like that yeah. children don't need fixing yeah so we're constantly <laughs> battling that um whereas if i try to understand what about me is bringing this out in the child right is it my tone of voice is it my um words is it my availability or the lack of avail availability to my child right so my presence so what about me can bring out what i want to see in that child and and the really one thing I tell all parents, including myself, is how can I role model what I want to see in them? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we, we could be sort of reflecting identical words, but I think also just, you know, both of us being in the space of well-being, transformation, education also, but also as parents, 
I think we should acknowledge that we are very, very fallible. Like you said, we all have the best of intentions, but we don't yeah. always get it right. Not even, not even, certainly not me. And, and I think you've been very open as well with, with your struggles as a parent. So to anybody that's feeling like it's they're just not doing enough, do know that that as long as we're coming from a place of as much consciousness as we can bring in, uh, it's all right. Nobody's really expecting us to get 100 on 100. In fact, I, I think that may be a fallacy because we can never truly understand another mind, right? The child's... And, and you, you say something very important here, Sandhya, which is we're so hard on ourselves, you know, because we hold ourselves to... I think uh, standards which are just not defined. Who who says you know what sort of parents one needs to be? Yeah, yeah there's nothing there's, there's there's nothing there that defines it for us except what what we put in our own minds. And so, the guilt that comes with it, or you know the the need for perfection, then the beating self up. So, this is something that I tell myself a lot, and I give to you know people I'm working with as a, as a huge permission, I'm a good enough parent. Yeah, what I'm doing right now is just good enough. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. One of my seniors uh, told me during my, my learning, she's like, there's only one uh, golden rule of parenting and that is a 100% guarantee that you are going to screw it up, you know? So I was like, oh my God, thank you. It was such a relief to hear that. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> oh, and it's okay, it's okay. You know, like you said, kids are so yeah. resilient and, and as long as we're doing our best, they will turn out okay, you know, at the end. There's no guarantees to anything in life. Um, Nisha, what, I mean, again, now this is looking broadly at, at, at children over, uh, over the years and, you know, across different ages. Overall, we tend to sort of stereotype every generation uh, we're Gen X, but we stereotype us ourselves. We'd be stereotype millennials, the the baby boomers. Mm, how equipped, in your experience, are, are you seeing? You know, young children, teenagers, young adults today. How equipped are they with the kind of parenting that that you and I have done, for example, to face the world today? It's a tough question. I don't know, but but and that's so. such a big sort of umbrella question. So I'm really thinking. Do I even have an answer to that? You know, um, I think what's happening in this generation, Sandhya, is the technological advancements are just so rapid and so sort of all-consuming, mm -hmm. right? Where, where um, I think in our, for, for Gen X, you know, handwriting was important. Today, really, does anybody look at handwriting even, right? They look at typing skills, how yes. proficient you are. I mean, a, a, a six-year-old can code. Yeah, that's that's yeah. something phenomenal. And it's almost as if, you know, a, a newborn baby knows how to operate smartphones. I mean, they just come with that sort of <laughs> intelligent so software preloaded, right? <laughs> almost, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think, and also, I, I, you know, I see a lot of hyperactivity. Uh, um, you know, I don't like to label and call, um, you know, names to conditions that children experience, but I do see there's a lot of hyperactivity, but hyper-focus. Mm -hmm. Wow, great. Huh. Um, which I think is is sort of an evolution. Yeah, I think it's an evolution sort of, you know, faster, Okay, my internet is acting iffy again. Let me just wait. Don't worry about it. This is the new normal and we just roll <laughs> the blows. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Um, so I think what's happening is the, the, the landscape and, and, you know, is making our children sort of move into that environment of being more, you know, fast paced, mm -hmm. sort of being able to be hyper most of the time, but be focused when they need to be, mm -hmm. you know, finish a certain project, be, maybe multitask. Um, uh, and, and how parents are equipping or not, I really don't know. But I think this is something that we're grappling with, you know, um, is my child on a screen too much, you know, they're, they're, they're on gadgets so much, they're, they're online and gaming, they're on social media this much. But I think that's the way, that's the way that the world is heading, you know, and, and I think our children being in that space is where they need to be. Yeah, yeah. Since since you I completely second that since you brought it up uh, you must get a lot of 
complaints about kids being online too much or or um, um, any thoughts on on you know and and of course we have like documentaries and and you know alarmist articles that come out yeah. of the dangers of of gaming and what it creates in children i think a lot of these have been um uh, discredited by actual studies by data driven but what has your experience been and what what's what's your thumb rule for for this worry that that we parents have yeah so um i have just one thing that i go by if the child is is otherwise socially active you know um uh, functional and by functional i mean is is attentive to his his or her academics you know uh, goes out meets his or her friends is 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 communicating in the family i really then don't have a you know don't see it as a red flag if the child is also gaming i don't believe that then they're they're hiding you know or, or living a virtual life yeah. but if if that is not happening and the child is only i mean the child's only source of sort of stimulation recognition all of that is coming from the video game or or you know the online world then that for me is a red flag yes yes so true so true and and so if we are seeing this is there anything that we can do first before we reach out to a professional like a psychotherapist you yeah so one of the things i practice myself and 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 ask parents who reach out you know especially saying kids are on pubg and you know naming all the other games which i don't even know is um uh have you ever sat with your child and played with them yeah what happens to your kid when you actually spend time and ask curious questions like you know why are you building this structure in minecraft why does it look like this and not like that what is the purpose of you know this this mission in 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 some one of those shooting games or you know what happens if you you fail so is there an is there a trying to understand why is my child doing this rather than trying to stop it and just say no it's not good for you right are you are you trying to see here what happens with your child when they're engaged in this sort of thing and then have conversations you know I, i've noticed that you've spent the last 3 hours here how do you feel about it why how come you're spending this much time there what does it give you mm -hmm. and you know i think we might just be surprised by some of what they have to say right um like my son will tell me you know i have 8 hours free today so what if i spend these 3 hours there right and and i know i give him a lot of tasks to do at home responsibilities it's all checked yeah yeah so now what do i tell him don't yeah. be you know don't be doing what you love to do absolutely absolutely and i think if we don't give children the opportunity to kind of take responsibility and then also you know face the consequences of failing to take responsibility but to define these for themselves you know it's very easy for us to say i think you should study for 3 hours every single day but do are we able to keep up an activity for 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 the time that i mean look at workouts for example right i mean we were all we all believe that we should be able to work out an hour a day but it doesn't happen that way every day so i think to just to give that permission as well to two children absolutely and look at us sandhya how much are we on gadgets ourselves you know as parents are, you, you know we're on um, social media we're on the phone constantly whether it's for work or for entertainment or you know just past timing we ourselves are so you know hooked on to all of these uh, gadgets or screens yeah. and so you know if if i want my child to do something different i need to show him or her how i can't be telling yeah absolutely i couldn't agree with that more um nisha now you're based in bangalore but but um, first of all tell us how we find you but also tell us if if geography is a limitation to us accessing you or or you know learning about i mean being involved in the work that you do yeah so i'm on uh, linkedin nisha rao um i'm on facebook but i can barely take any credit or claim many you know sort of a uh, time they have not there much but um um one of the beauty of you know uh, the results of the pandemic has been that you know now everything's gone online and whereas earlier i was limited to meeting people face to face in bangalore mm -hmm. now i have clients from across india and outside as well you know and and so i think um reaching out to me through through you know um, i can share my my mobile number you know sending me a message and then sort of fixing up an initial 
uh, you know, understanding of what really needs to happen. Because most often, like, you said you know it's it's the parents who need some help more than the child yeah so i i just spend a little time talking to the uh, parents and helping them sort of see the child really doesn't need any work here mm -hmm. yeah so yeah so yeah my mobile number or linkedin or an email i could share all of this at mm -hmm. the end of our absolutely we'll we'll share it in the description wherever we we post this video um, thank you so much uh, for me personally as well. I've been I've been so much in admiration of the work that you do, and you know just the number of lives that you're impacting. In a sense, this is the world that we're going to see tomorrow, and that you know it's, it's such an honor and a privilege to to be you know with somebody who's 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 investing time into the people that are going to run our world tomorrow. And uh, yeah, absolutely, that's my belief as well, which is why I thought you know I'd rather work with work with them, you know. Before, before it's too late, so to speak. I mean, it's not that dire, but, um, and, and, and truly, you know, each child is just so, so unique and so, so ready for more, you know? I, 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 I think that's what energizes me and sort of pushes me. Every, every interaction is so beautiful and so much learning for me because I've changed as a parent through my work with children. So true, so true. Although I work with older, uh, I mean, young adults, so older children in that sense. <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more and I'm inspired every day. Uh, I also, you know, just, just how, mal how, how elastic or how plastic the word uh, as the word is their, their brains are brains um, are, yeah. I, I sometimes i like i'm like please hold on to that thinking because this is going to save you a midlife crisis when you're 40 <laughs> you <know? laughs> and i and i and i keep joking whenever i do these talks and listen I, you know if if you just keep saying what you're saying right now you'll you'll be running me out of business when you're 40 and i'll be only too happy that that you know? so, so yeah it's just wonderful and, and please i mean you know continue to do the work that you do. And I will be sharing your contact details with everybody. Thank you for your time. I know it's a busy, busy day for you. So I'll let you go. It's been lovely talking to you. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you, Sandhya. I've had a lovely time as well. Thank you.